As you can see from this footage, the 16mm transfer system is up and working. There's still a couple of issues that I'd like to fix. Mainly, I don't have any film safety sensors, and the system needs intermittent speed tweaks for everything to run smoothly. I'll talk about those issues later. I've transferred some Super 16 and regular 16 footage, mostly older Kodak 7248 and 7205. At the end of this video, I'll compare grain reduction and enhancement, as it seems everyone has a different opinion on how much to apply. Let's first go back where we left off in part two, installing the components. There's two things I want to point out. As I went along, I drilled and fitted the components one by one, then removed each before going on to the next part. This way, I keep all the components as clean as possible until final installation. The second thing is, I'm not going to super detail all the measurement, drilling, tapping, and cutting. It seems that most people are interested in that much nitty-gritty. Since I have the footage, though, I might post a couple of bonus videos on Patreon if there's enough interest. This is a bracket for the motor that I'm going to install for the film gate transport. This motor will have a belt on it, and it will attach to the pulley on the film mechanism. I tried out the position and found the place where the belt tension would be the best. I use Loctite glue on all the set screws, just to make sure nothing comes loose over time. One thing I want to note is that I ended up putting a piece of rubber underneath of the stepper motor, because I was afraid it was creating too much vibration that would transmit to the film gate. And now I can try the camera and its mount. I found a wooden crate that was just about the height of the future legs. I used this to temporarily suspend the whole build. I then figured out how to mount the camera in order for it to be both perpendicular and the right distance from the film. The key is filling up as much of the digital sensor with the actual film frame. It was a little tricky moving in and out and up and down, but I finally got it locked in. The nice thing about this mount is you can slide it back and forth with great precision. Now I need to screw in the brackets. I want to make sure that everything is as perpendicular and straight as possible. I experimented with different configurations of the bracket. I can slide the camera back and forth and adjust its vertical height. I later decided that it needed to be even more rigid, so I added another support bar in the center. I then attached a support bracket that comes with the Leowa 25mm macro lens. Everything is screwed in place and proved to be very stable. Now I need a tensioner to press against the supply reel so that it doesn't take off spinning. I came up with the idea of using an L bracket with a screw that moves in and out, held in place with a nut. I epoxied a piece of felt onto it. The screw can move in and out and vary the tension as needed on the supply reel. Now I've got to work on that take-up spindle. This is a bit complicated. I wanted to support both the motor itself and the gear rod at the top. The top of the 10 millimeter rod, where the gear is attached, pokes through the 1 8 inch aluminum baseboard. I put a 10 millimeter ball bearing in so that it can rotate freely. I made these little metal clips to hold the bearing in place. I then rigged up the two L brackets to work with the motor bracket. Again, I was trying to keep the motor as perpendicular as possible, and it also had to be the right height so that it engaged the gear on the spindle at just the right place. Those two long screws in the front I eventually got rid of and came up with a different way of supporting it. I didn't feel that the back L brackets were quite enough to hold the weight of the motor, so I added another bracket in place of those two screws. The height of the gear is critical, as it has to mesh smoothly with the take-up spindle gear. Now I can put the legs on in each corner. This is the power supply. 
I took it apart to use the built-in threaded holes to mount it, then reassembled it. Here's the LED driver, again just a simple matter of mounting it. The brown and blue wires feed 110 AC voltage, and the red and white output DC voltage for the LED light source. I then fitted the stepper motor drivers and variable speed controls, one for each motor. These require the most wiring. A lot of the screws needed to be countersunk so that their heads don't stick up and possibly get into the film path. I'm experimenting here with some film rollers that came out of an old 16mm camera mag. Ultimately, I ended up not using these anyway. At this point, I thought I had drilled all the holes necessary for mounting everything. This is what the plate looked like, around 83 holes. The big holes in the bottom right are for the rocker switches that will control power for everything. Now I thoroughly cleaned the aluminum baseboard and remounted everything more or less permanently. These are the rocker switches. One switch controls the power and another controls the LED. The third switch is extra. As you can see, I added three more legs in various center positions to provide more stability. In addition, I replaced the momentary contact switch, since I didn't think the original was durable enough. This one has a long metal arm that I bent to smoothly make contact with the pin. Still paranoid that the camera was going to shake, I decided to add these makeshift legs on the brackets. The legs are made from long screws and a coupling. This way they can be adjusted and bolted down. The wiring looks complicated, but it's pretty simple. The power supply gets an AC plug, and the stepper motors and drivers are fed from 12 volt DC provided by the power supply. These also have multiple wires that need to be correctly placed to control the motors. The LED driver is wired through the rocker switch for a 110 feed and 30 volt DC output to the LED itself. I tested the system at this point and found a significant problem. Although it was theoretically working, the tension of the film exiting the gate was too high. As the take-up motor is always turning at the same rate, the speed of the film slowly increases as more is accumulated on the take-up reel. I thought the slippage clutch on the take-up spindle would adjust enough to pull the film smoothly throughout the load. In other words, it's designed to slip if the tension on the film gets too high, preventing it from breaking. Unfortunately, the system is designed so that the film camera take-up tension is relatively high, and the film entering and leaving the gate is at a relatively low tension. In the camera, there's a loop of film feeding the gate. I was hoping that at the slow speeds I would be running the film, the loop wouldn't be necessary. As you can see, the system did work, but the film is tugged on the registration pin and I felt this would cause unsteadiness. Back to the drawing board. I decided to use the sprocket set that Ari builds into each film magazine. The film is loaded around sprockets on each side, forming a loop in the middle. The Ari magazine sprockets are driven by a gear connected through to the main motor, thereby automatically maintaining the correct speed and loop. On my system, I would have to supply power to the gears with a motor since I didn't leave enough room for gearing. I first cut out the sprocket set and gears from a discarded magazine. I calculated where the sprockets needed to go in order to form a loop for the gate. I didn't think the loop size is critical since the film is moving at about a frame or two per second. I needed to cut another hole into the aluminum baseboard so the gears could extend down below. I found another matching gear on eBay and planned to install yet another small stepper motor to drive this gear. I also cut a moon-shaped hole so it would be possible to rotate the main drive gear with your finger when loading the film. 
Honestly, it would have been better to figure out how to link the sprocket gears mechanically to the film gate motor, but I didn't see any easy way to do that and provide the correct sprocket speed for the loop. After a bit of fiddling, I came up with a way to mount the gear onto the motor and then mount the motor bracket to the aluminum baseboard. Like the take-up motor gear, I slid the end of the shaft through a small ball bearing mounted in the baseboard. This keeps the gear perpendicular. Since I wanted to do Super 16 transfers, I had the sprockets and guide plate machined back on the side opposite the film sprockets. I then reassembled the group. I mounted the sprocket set onto the unit and left a little slack so that proper gear meshing could be done. I then needed another motor controller and driver. Mounting the new gear motor also required moving the LED driver slightly. Now the wiring. Attaching 12 volt power from the power supply as well as the various wires to the motor driver and controller. Next, I connected the camera remote triggering device. I bought a no-name trigger for my Lumix S5 camera and disassembled it. The key is transferring these tiny resistors to the leads of the momentary contact switch in the same order. If done right, the switch should make contact every time the pin rolls against it, snapping a digital frame. I also didn't solder in the LED before now, as I didn't want to inadvertently damage it. After securing the LED with heat sink glue and screws, the positive and negative leads were soldered on. I did a quick test and found that my original idea of using the piece of gel frost with a blue filter was not diffuse enough. There was a hot spot in the center of the frame. I found some thicker, more diffuse white plastic and mounted it even farther from the LED. I also tested a frame with white balancing and found the blue filter wasn't necessary. The plastic spread the light very evenly across the frame and also needed to be removable, since the distance required to get even light spread now interfered with the gate opening. Oh well. Here's the unit ready for a couple rolls of footage. I have mostly negative flats that were shot in the late 1990s and early 2000s, some on Super 16, some on regular, on cameras ranging from Aton XTR prods to ARRI SRs and Eclair ACLs. There's still a couple issues with the system which I'll talk about in a minute. First, the film is placed on the feed platter, sprockets down, then fed through the sprocket drive. Film leader is pulled out and a loop formed around the gate. The end is then fed into the other side of the sprockets and then attached to the take-up spool. The registration pin is rolled back and the film is loaded into the gate. All of this is pretty much the same as any ARRI 16S, 16M, or 16BL. I white balanced on a frame of unexposed orange backing. This takes care of the large orange color shift in post. The film is advanced to the first image. The camera focus and exposure is then set. Generally, I set focusing with the lens at 2.8, then close down to f8 for good depth of field. I record the frame with the electronic shutter only so as to prevent vibration and wear on the mechanical shutter. 1 60th of a second to sync with the LED. I record 6,000 by 4,000 pixel RAW files only. Generally, there's no problem in capturing the entire range of exposure from the negative. I use a fast SDXC card for recording the images and can only go about 1 to 1.5 frames per second for the digital camera to keep up. 800 feet of film, almost 22 minutes, takes about 6 hours to capture. After the job's finished, the reels can be reversed to rewind. Using a fast computer for post-processing is important. 
I load the raw files into Adobe After Effects as a sequence. I rotate and size down the image to 4K. Generally, I don't do any color processing in After Effects. I export the 4K file as a ProRes 444 file, then import that into DaVinci Resolve. In Resolve, I do the color image invert, color correction, grain reduction, and any dust cleanup. Grain reduction seems to be a sticking point for many. I personally don't like to see a lot of grain, just a bit. Some of the faster 16 stocks show a lot of grain when transferred. Here's another point about enhancement. I personally find it's easier and more convenient to output 2K or HD files and then up-res them to 4K in Topaz AI. Some people will probably find this sacrilege, but I don't think there's enough detail in a non-enhanced 16mm 4K image. Here's an example. This image is straight 4K with just color correction in DaVinci Resolve. There's no grain reduction or enhancement. This is the same image with grain and AI processing applied. As I said, it's a matter of choice, but I prefer the sharper, cleaner image for stock footage. Now, let me address the issues and other caveats with this machine. First, and what I consider the biggest problem, is that I haven't been able to get the sprocket motor to run at a consistent speed. Over time, the loop grows or shrinks, and the motor needs to be adjusted slightly. I'm not an electronic engineer, so this problem is annoying. The motors for the take-up and the gate are relatively flexible in their speed, especially the take-up since it has a spindle clutch. The sprocket motor, even though it's the same motor I used in the gate, needs to be timed so that it runs within a particular speed ratio relative to the gate motor. I don't know how to do this. I even tried changing out the driver controller so that it gives me a digital speed readout, but stepper motors drift slightly in speed over time. If it could speed up and slow down itself, that would be incredibly helpful. Next, I need to construct a shield to hide and protect the LED light. Shouldn't be that difficult. The machine needs to be installed and set up in a stable, consistent place. This would allow very precise camera placement without all the minute adjustments. I'd also like to install automatic shutoffs for each side of the loop so that if the loop gets too small, the machine will shut down, ensuring film safety. One more thing, I should install a roller to guide the film upward after the sprockets so that large reels won't be fed downward, possibly scratching the film on the sprocket case. Those are the major improvements I'd like to make. I welcome any constructive criticism or help. Here's a couple of things I'd like to clarify. Yes, it's slow. I don't mind setting it up and letting it go. The same with the computer processing. However, as computers and cameras get faster, the whole system will get faster. I won't use it for damaged or badly shrunken film. I actually don't have very much of that. It has a pin registration, which requires good sprocket holes and very good splices. Finally, it's cheap, provided there's a decent digital camera to use. I estimate I've spent well under $1,000 for everything, not including the digital camera. For me and for what I want to do, it works fine. I really enjoy the building part, as well as the filmmaking. I guess combining everything makes me a happy filmmaker. If you made it this far and liked this video, Please subscribe 